Let's pray together. Father, we have no hope other than the hope that we have in Christ. We have hope in Christ because he is your design. He is your solution to rescue sinners from the consequence of their sin. Oh, Father, I pray that as we turn our attention to your son, that you would enable us to do it in a way that is worshipful to you, a way that is honoring to you, a way that is pleasing to you. So we ask for your grace towards that end, and we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this is the point in our service where we take some time to remember Jesus around his table. It's a time for Christians to remember the person of Jesus and who he is and what he did on their behalf at the cross. In a few moments, we're going to take a wafer and a bit of juice, and these are symbols of the body and the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross. To help us remember Jesus rightly today, we're going to be looking at a passage that indicates Jesus, that describes Jesus as man's representative in God's system of justice. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to Romans chapter 8? We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 4 together. And if you don't have a Bible, there are men who are going to be coming down the aisles. Simply raise your hand. They will get you a copy of God's Word. If you don't actually own a copy of God's Word, this is our gift to you so that you can begin reading God's Word for yourself. This is a passage that is well known to many Christians. Um, Paul has just finishing the discussion about the conflict that he had in his unbelief. Back in his unbelief, he was a well-educated but unregenerate Jew. And he joyfully concurred. He joyfully agreed with God's law at a heart level in the inner man. He did. He joyfully agreed that God's law was good. But because he was still unregenerate, his actual practice of his life was governed by his flesh. So he was in a very conflicted condition. And he asks the question in verse 24 of chapter 7, who will set me free from the body of this death? And then he answers the question in verse 25, and he uses our text this morning to explain how that happens. So let's read verses 1 through 4 together of chapter 8. And as we read verse 3, take a note of the identity of Christ and the work of Christ. So Paul writes to the church in Rome, and he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. In verse 1 here, we see the word condemnation. It's used again later in the passage, and it's important that we understand what condemnation is. Uh, it's the pronouncement of a sentence after guilt has been determined. Sinful man is guilty before God, and God's response to that guilt is to pronounce a sentence of judgment on that sinful man. But in verse 1, Paul says that there's none of that. There's none of that condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The guilty verdict, the guilty condition, the guilty position has been removed. Those who are in Christ are released from the penalty of their sin. And Paul explains why that is in verse 2. And he begins by talking about the law of the spirit of life. It's really important that we get our mind around that and what that really is. This is the set of principles that rule over the person who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. These principles are the principles that set the sinner free from the law of sin and of death. They liberate the sinner from the condemnation that they truly deserve. And there is no better news than that in all of creation. But notice that this law of the spirit of life is in a person. It's in the person of Christ Jesus. It's tied to the person and the work of Christ. And that's what we want to notice. And that's what we want to remember this morning. And it's significant as we look at verse 3 to notice that Christ comes into the view in the context of God doing something for a sinful man that sinful man is not capable of doing for himself. Christ comes into view because Christ and Christ alone possesses the righteousness that sinful man needs to be in a right relationship with God. He needs that righteousness, but he can never possess it on his own. Unrighteous man will always fall short of God's standard of righteousness. 
So God made his righteousness available to unrighteous man. And he did so by sending his son into this world. So let's notice two things about Jesus' identity in verse 3. And first, he was sent in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus was very similar to other men. He was born of a woman. He had all the same physical needs and all the same outward characteristics of any other man, of anybody else. And because of this, Jesus was qualified to stand in man's place. He's qualified to represent sinful man in God's system of justice. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is what we understand to be different about Jesus. And that is that he was sent as an offering for sin. God's Old Testament law demanded. It actually required that the innocent sacrifice was what was offered in place of the guilty. The sacrifice itself had to be innocent. If you think back to Exodus chapter 12 and the story of the Passover, the lamb whose blood was put on the doorposts had to be an unblemished lamb. When God was explaining the sin offering to Israel, he was explaining the rules and the requirements for that. In Leviticus 4, there was a lamb that was offered. And that lamb that was offered had to be a lamb that was without defect. Now, these lambs, these animals, they were under the curse just like everything else. But the point is that there was no stain in them. There was no defect in them. And the same thing is true about Jesus. There was no stain of sin in Jesus. And that is why he was qualified to represent man and to serve in man's place. And it's that Jesus that God used to condemn sin in sinful man. And he did that at the hands of Roman soldiers and Jewish leaders. The Roman soldiers nailed Jesus to a cross and Jesus hung there for six hours. And it was in that time that Jesus actually suffered God's condemnation against all of those who would look to him. For every single person, for every one of their sinful deeds throughout all of human history, for those Jesus died, for those who would look to him as their savior and their Lord, for those who would recognize that they needed a representative who had the righteousness that they need. And so finally in verse four, we see the result of Jesus' work. We see the result is that God's demand, God's requirement for righteousness is actually met in the person of Jesus. But we need to be very careful and observe who it is that that requirement of righteousness is met for. That requirement is met for those who walk according to the Spirit. Those people who are living under the law of the Spirit of life, the new requirements of how a person lives when they have new life in Christ. If this is you today, If you are a person who has experienced the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in your life and you're living under these new principles that govern the new life that you have in Christ, please join with us today and take the elements. In a few moments, they're going to come to you. When the elements come to you, take them and hold them and ponder the work of Christ on the cross that as your representative, he actually satisfied God's wrath. He received your condemnation. Then when your heart is ready, take the elements on your own. I want to take just a minute to look at the verses that follow our passage today. Uh, there's, what's happening here is that Paul is making a contrast. Paul is contrasting the person who has new life in the spirit with another kind of person. And that person is the person who lives under their flesh, the person who is in the flesh, the person who walks according to their flesh, the person who sets their mind on the things of the flesh. Quite simply, that is the person who lives under their own self-rule, That's the person who uses themselves as their own standard to determine what is right and what is good. And there's two things we need to understand here about that person. Uh, The first is that the Lord's table is is not for that person. The Lord's table is for Christians. So if, if you're here today and you're not a follower of Christ, just take the elements and pass them to the person next to you. Uh, But the second thing, and much more importantly, that you need to understand if you drop down to verse 13 is you see the end that God has decreed for that person. The end that God has decreed for that person is that that person must die. Paul is writing there, he's not talking about a physical death, he's talking about a spiritual death. A spiritual death where in eternity that person is separated from God in a place called hell and in eternity in a a lake of fire. And what the person does in that time frame is they do the work that Jesus did in six hours. They spend an eternity satisfying God's wrath against them because of their sin. Today is an opportunity for you to turn to Christ. It's an opportunity for you to see that up to this point, God has been giving you the opportunity to turn to him. His kindness to you, his general kindness to you is not an affirmation of your lifestyle and your choice to reject him. It's an opportunity for you to turn to him. So I encourage you, I beg you, I plead with you to do that today.
Uh, after the service, there will be some people up here by the door. You can spend time talking with them about what it looks like to have new life in Christ. I will be outside at the info table at the front. I would love to talk with you. Uh, but men, come and serve us. In a few minutes, I'll come and close our time in prayer.